All right, good afternoon, everyone. We've kind of saved the best for last. Oh, no pressure, no. Don't tell the other people that present, sorry, oh, that I said that. So this is really meant to be an informal forum for you to ask the scientists literally anything. Um, so I'm going to spare you a really formal introduction. If you don't know Ed and Jeff by now, get your head out of the sand. And um, this is Dr. Ed Wild, Dr. Jeff Carroll. They are the founders of HD Buzz, and they are here to answer your questions about HD. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Thanks. We, uh, I'm Ed. We're standing the wrong way around, Jeff. You need to be on the other side of me so that we uh, go over there. We like to stand like a map of the world. So he's America and I'm England. And then you know which is which. Because otherwise there'd be no way to tell us apart. It, uh, you can also tell because I'm taller and mightier. <laughs> and I'm the, f the funny one. And increasingly, as time goes on, the better looking one. So we, uh, I work in the National Health Service in the UK, which is a socialized med medicine system which is dr uh, drastically underfunded at all times. So when it, we arrive in a room which has a um, lectern-mounted microphone, and we're told we need it for the live feed, hello internet, um, I uh, do what, I, what we do in the NHS when something's not quite right, and I dismantled it and put it back together, which is why I look like a 1970s game show host <laughs> with one of those really long, old-school microphones. So, uh, Jeff arrived literally 22 minutes ago in a taxi uh, from Italy. He didn't get the taxi the whole way. He got a series of planes, and uh, anything to say about that? How do you feel? I feel fine. I, I, I haven't slept in quite a while, so I'm even more disinhibited than normal. So this should go, this should go really swimmingly, I'm sure. Um, so we, I guess we've been doing these three conferences or three conventions now, and um, it's really fun. And each time we try to kind of plan, like, what are people going to ask us about? And what, what are people wondering about? Whether it comes, uh, questions come about uh, basic science, uh, research into new drugs and therapies, um, or clinical stuff. Ed's a real doctor. I'm just a scientist. Um, so if people have questions, and we just realize we don't need to direct it at all. And really, we just need to take questions from people. Um, we do have... Um, some incentive for asking good questions, subjectively defined by me and Ed. Uh, These are official, world exclusive, new third generation HD Buzz hats. So they uh, this this they feature a new logo, which is not even officially launched yet. We're launching it tomorrow, so you guys are among the first people in the world to see it. You will absolutely be the first people in the world to have these hats. P people who ask a question, if we think it's a good question. Uh, we have a very low bar, by the way, for what constitutes a good question. <laughs> but it's not allowed to be, can I have a hat? So um, any questions, put your hand up, and we will repeat the questions, and then you get a hat. A hand went up over there, a lady with the sunglasses on the top of her head. No, 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 no. I, I get the microphone. You, you asked me two questions. And uh, yeah, because you were asking about going to college, right? So I meant ask him about that. Because he did that whole thing, and he's American, and he's a super smart boy, and everyone loves Jeff. Um, having said that, I will let him answer the question about how to, how to do research. Uh, to, you you want to you wanna participate in research? Um, I'm so bad at throwing hats. Maybe I should maybe I should throw the hats from now on. Yeah. So I think there's a couple different ways to get involved in research, and I'm going to like t take your question and kind of go off it a little bit. So um, I would say the number one way for people to get involved if they're from an HD family is to sign up for the Enroll HD study. Um, the, the super exciting trials that I'm sure we're going to talk about with the gene silencing and all these really exciting things that are happening right now are built on observations of HD family members. And the, the track HD study and the predict HD study are finished enrolling now. 
uh, but the enroll HD study is ongoing. That's the, that's the most important thing a family member can do. You don't need to be tested. As long as you're from an HD family, you can participate in enroll HD. That's the, and there's sites all over North America, and they're getting more and more all the time. So check. I'm sure they have a desk out in the enroll people, somebody? They do? Okay. So go see them. That's the first thing you can do. And, uh, you know, on another level, if, if you want to get involved in research yourself, um, you should come talk to me because I'll tell you uh, how uh, difficult slash wonderful a career in research really is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Ed's feeding me information, which never happens in our relationship. I think sometimes people get a little bit confused about like what is the point of enroll, um, and be because they don't see it like what's the actual outcome immediately. It's it's this ongoing observation of people. It's open ended, which is fantastic. What what it really is, and Ed was whispering right here, it's a platform study. And what that means is that if I'm a, a person who studies, say, the immune system, right, and I'm curious as to whether somebody who's had an infection has faster or slower Huntington's disease. That's an interesting question. And rather than go and build my whole like set of patients to go answer that question, the enroll study already has them there, right? So other researchers, whether they're from HD or not, can come to the enroll database, the enroll subjects, and actually ask those kind of questions really fast. It's really fantastic. Okay. So uh, <laughs> the other thing enroll is, is a database of people um, which will be used for recruiting into clinical trials. So the next, I mean, it's already being used for that. Every clinical trial we run in London, the first thing we do when the trial is about to start up is we look at our Enroll HD database and see which patients we have that match the inclusion criteria for the trial. So in other words, we, put, we can set the criteria to what the trial needs, and then the database will tell us which 10, 20, 50 people are eligible. Um, if you're not on Enroll HD, you still can do clinical trials, but you'll be way down the list of people that your center calls. So if, if you're super enthusiastic, the best way to get involved in clinical trials in the future is Enroll HD now, even if you, there aren't any trials that you're eligible for now. Okay. You, the gentleman in the striped uh, uh, shirt uh, had his question up within milliseconds of the previous lady, so far away. So the question was, there's a drug called verapamil, which is a calcium channel blocker, which has been shown in mouse studies, presumably performed by Dave, David Rubenstein in Cambridge, right? Yeah. Um, and it enhances autophagy. Autophagy is one of the garbage um, collection and recycling mechanisms in our cells. Verapamil, um, I am familiar with as a drug that's used for cardiac um, conditions. It's used for uh, treating cardiac rhythm problems, and it's also used to treat some neurological conditions, including um, cluster headache, I believe. The, the reason I remember it is because you use it to treat patients who have an abnormally fast heartbeat. So I, when I was trying to learn all the names of the thousands of drugs as a medical student, I used to call it very rapid milk instead of verapamil. <laughs> cool story, bro. <laughs> Thanks. I know, right? <laughs> Anytime you want to jump in and say something complimentary about me. So, verapamil... Um, so it, I think it falls into the category of drugs which could theoretically help based on what we know about the biochemical things that go wrong in HD. We understand a ton about what happens in HD. And every time we understand something, uh, every discovery opens up maybe a dozen different new ways that could theoretically um, fight HD. A couple of things to say, though. Verapamil, one, the one thing I remember about it is it's quite dangerous if you are not careful. So if you take too much of it, or if you have the wrong kind of heart problem, it can make things worse. Patients who take it for headaches have to have ECGs all the time. It's not a super safe drug. I mean, it's not like something you could get over the counter at a health food store. So um, there's some degree of risk. What there is on the other side is this theoretical possibility it could help cellular recycling, but there's no evidence from humans that it does. 
Now, that, as you say, that's true of almost every drug that's already on the market. And there may be something to what you say that this drug is unlikely to get tested because there's no huge amount of drug company money in it. But governments fund research into generics and will run clinical trials into generics. Generics are drugs that, have, that are no longer on patent. So, um, but there's certainly a, a lot of governmental funding for um, repurposing of generics. Um, um, and in fact, Giovanna Malucci in Cambridge um, just had a paper out where she, she looked at a ton of drugs that were already licensed and, and their effects on neurodegeneration. Um, so, you know, she's next door to David Rubenstein now. So she might be able to, this might be something that she could pursue. I think, I, you know, I have to say, and not, not just for dogmatic reasons, since it's theoretically possible it might work, what we also know is that drugs that might work could also do harm. So um, uh, the drug minocycline is a very good example. Minocycline is in was intended to do almost exactly the same thing, autophagy enhancer. And it was tested in ALS, and the trial had to be stopped because it was making the disease worse. So if we're taking drugs outside of clinical trials, the risk is, I mean, it could be great, and you've obviously personally had a very good experience with it. Um, and I'm not gonna say don't take it. I think, you know, people should keep doing what works for them. And you presumably are taking it with an awareness of all of the risks that I've discussed. Um, in general, though, I think the, the advice is uh, do things that we know are good for your body and your brain. And actually, the best uh, autophagy enhancer in humans that we know of is exercise, aerobic exercise. And I can tell from our conversation earlier and from looking at you now that that is already something that you do. So maybe the Rapamil is helping. But um, Jeff has something he'd like to say. Um, I just want to interject quickly and say that I, I've run HD mouse trials since 2004. That's what I do with my life. And a successful mouse trial to me is like 1% of the way to, like, I'll speak for myself. I carry the mutation. My sibling, three of my siblings do as well. Before I would recommend any of them to take, take a drug, like the bar for me, a, a successful mouse trial is 1% of that because there's a lot of differences between mice and humans, even with well-run mouse trials, which isn't always what happens. So not to, not to denigrate the specific drug you're just talking about, but sometimes people say, oh, there was a mouse trial, so I should take it. I just want to say, like, personally, I don't find that very convincing. Right, and the one thing that, mouse, that, that we know about every single mouse trial so far is that success in a mouse has predicted failure in a human. Every drug that's worked in a mouse has not worked in a human so far for slowing the disease. But we hope that that will change soon. And, we, and mice are still our best way of figuring out which drugs to take into humans. I would argue ASOs, but we're being really Debbie Downer right now. So um, the young lady in the middle. Oh, they will. Uh, that sounds like a great question for someone who is a real doctor. <laughs> oh, Jeff, you're too, uh, you're too cruel on yourself. I'm, I'm both kinds of doctor. <laughs> um, so I think the thing about HD is that one thing we know is it's super easy to make it worse. It's really difficult to make it better, but it's super easy to make it worse. So if you run into a brick wall every day as soon as you get up, or if you... Um, drink a thousand times as much alcohol as, as you're supposed to, or if you abuse uh, drugs, or if you smoke, it chances, or if you don't exercise, chances are those things will all make HD worse. So in a way, we already know how to modify the course of HD. The trouble is we can only do it in a bad direction. Um, it's certainly true that having two neurological illnesses at once, or two illnesses that could impact the brain at once, is w worse than having one, right? It's very unlikely that a second disease will come along that will turn out to be the cure for Huntington's disease, although that has happened in human history with things like malaria and sickle cell disease. But anyway, I do digress. Um, I, so uh, I think the thing, if you have another med medical condition, the thing is to, and I know you're already doing this, to keep it, um, look after yourself. I mean, this is true of everyone in this room. If you discover you have a second condition, um, the best way to look after your brain is to, is to follow the medical advice for that um, condition. And that's, you know, that's also true of people who don't have a second condition. You still need to look after your brain. Eat well, eat a balanced diet, exercise. Very, very boring advice, but um, it's the best we can give. I have a cool science story because that's all I can contribute to this discussion. Uh, while we don't know of anything that makes HD better, there's really convincing evidence now that Huntington's mutation carriers get way less cancer than people who don't have the mutation, about half. 
I mean, this, I'm not saying people with HD don't get cancer, clearly they do, but they do about half the rate of people who don't have HD, which even corrected for their lifespan, which is super weird and just interesting, and I thought I'd throw it out there. It's not all bad news. So once we figure out this whole brain shrinking thing, everyone in the world is going to want HD mutation because it's going to protect them from, <laughs> from cancer. Hey, I just, I'm going to patent that next. Okay, another. <laughs> Quick legacy, you have your hand up. Yeah, so, the, so how do we, how do we track ba advancements in basic science um, and incorporate ideas from other fields? I think, I think HD is at the forefront of that, honestly. And I think there's so much momentum and so much resources in HD. I would say, if anything, right now, HD is dragging along other diseases. I just got back from a conference, uh, well, sometime recently, um, on CAG repeat diseases like Huntington's, but there are other diseases, I don't know if people know, that are caused by the same kind of genetic stutter but in other genes, and many of those are of a type called spinocerebellar ataxias or SCAs, and it was interesting to be at this conference and see the people who study those other diseases, they were so excited to learn from us, and they're now starting ASO trials in mice, and I think, I think re we're really driving the whole field of neurodegeneration, but certainly we talk to other, um, other areas, uh, and, and there's a lot of cross-pollination. Right, and I think, uh, so the, uh, every scientist, like the scientists whose names you know, like Ed and Jeff and Michael Hayden and Amber and, uh, you know, the people whose names you know, each of those represents lots and lots of other scientists who don't come to meetings like this because they're, they're working, we make them work the whole time. Um, <laughs> and each of those has come from somewhere else, right? No, uh, very few people did Huntington's disease undergraduate, Huntington's disease PhD, Huntington's disease postdoc. So, uh, and every time someone new joins our lab, it's usually because they bring, uh, that what? Oh, you did. Yeah, yeah, I kind of did, but not quite. And it's usually because they bring with them some new piece of expertise from another area and some new technique. Um, and those people tend to stay, they're young, so they have a lot more energy. They tend to stay in, uh, involved in those areas as well. So I did, I went to a lot of Alzheimer's conferences while I was doing my PhD, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So um, I guess that's how we, we, figure, we figure it out because we're a big community that talks to each other and we read stuff. Who have a question? Wow, that's a good question. If we find a cure that removes the mutant protein, will that affect the gene? Give him a hat. Um, yeah, a small round of applause. Golf clap. <laughs> His next door neighbor wants a second hat right now. Yeah, okay. Um, so the techniques that we're currently, yes. With the techniques that we're currently working on to try and prevent the brain from making the protein. The protein is called mutant Huntington, um, and it's harmful. And so we've, we're testing drugs now that will hopefully switch off the production of that protein. And if that works, there's every chance that that will actually slow the progression of HD in people who have it and prevent HD in people who have the mutation. But that drug and drugs like it, the next few drugs we'll be testing, don't change the DNA at all. And that's probably a good thing, because once you change someone's DNA, it's very difficult to change it back. So right now, I think what we want to do is test drugs that work to switch off the protein, but drugs which we can stop quickly if some unexpected problem emerges, or we can reduce the dose later if some expected prob unexpected problem emerges. If we go snipping people's genes up, which is something that we're trying. So like three days ago, the first um, mouse experiment using gene editing, uh, using a technique called CRISPR, was published, uh, and, and that, was, that turned out that that made a big difference to those mice. But if we try that in humans, it's possible that bad things might happen that we don't yet understand, because those techniques are very new. And um, so it's sensible to test first the stuff that it sort of switches itself off, and then later we can move into editing people's genes. Uh, and doing that's theoretically possible, and it's something that we're working on. We want to get rid of the mutation from every cell in the body so that Huntington's stops. Next question. Go on, I will ask you, just because you're close. Does what, sorry? Huh. Does sleep apnea make HD worse? Uh, so sleep apnea is a condition in which people stop breathing while they are asleep. Um, and um, a lot of people don't know they have it. 
except they're tired all the time and sometimes grumpy and uh, or so they wake up with headaches in the morning um, and to treat it to you can diagnose it using a sleep study and um, some people have a, uh, a piece of breathing equipment that goes over the mouth and nose to keep the airways open at night and in most cases that treats the condition I don't know of any evidence that it makes HD worse um, and it's very un you know people who are not sleeping well their brains slow down a bit and they're they're you know, like if you've ever stayed up beyond your bedtime, I'm sure you haven't, but if you did, you might find that the next day you weren't thinking so clearly and you were maybe a bit more clumsy and stuff. And I think that that's what life is like all the time for people with sleep apnea. But um, as long as it's diagnosed and as long as treatment is started, people actually rapidly get better once the treatment happens. So I wouldn't think, I mean, if it's not treated, it might make the symptoms of HD worse, but I don't think it's something that will make HD go quicker. Oh. No, the lady at the front, and then the, and then the gentleman in purple. Yeah, the, um, and the, like a little terminology I'm going to throw in here. We, so we used to say, we, we, we've been saying gene silencing is like the brand name for this idea of lowering the production of the Huntington protein from the Huntington gene. And actually, it's kind of a bad word because silencing implies we're turning it off completely. And for most of the techniques that are being tried right now, including the one you're talking about, we're not doing that. We're reducing it by like 75% or 80%, hopefully, but not silencing. So we'll, you'll start hearing from us, uh, Huntington lowering. Huh. Okay, I'm going to. Okay. <laughs> I want you to start here, though, because it'd be funny. <laughs> you do it. I don't know what you're talking about. So there was this company from California called Isis Pharmaceuticals. And about a year ago, for reasons uh, no one uh, understands, they changed their name <laughs> to uh, Ionis Pharmaceuticals. It's funny. I did a funny. I just did. I <laughs> I've had so little sleep. I need a much better setup than that. <clears throat> So the Huntington lowering study that, that you're referring to that was six sites that were in Canada, Germany, and the UK um, uh, is, is a trial of this. So everybody, inherit, everybody with HD inherits a mutant HD uh, gene, usually just one from mom or dad, right? And that's in your DNA. Um, and um, that doesn't do anything by itself that's really bad for brain cells, we don't think. It's, so it's not the DNA mutation that causes Huntington's disease. It's this protein, right? The, the little molecular machine that goes around your cell and does bad stuff and eventually makes your brain cells dysfunction and die. Proteins are not made directly from DNA. DNA has the recipes for proteins, um, but your cells really like to take care of your DNA because if you screw up your DNA, you get cancer and you die. So the way that cells have evolved, all of our cells, is they go, they, th there's little machines that go into the nucleus, like the center of the cell where it's got your DNA, it's really safe. It makes a copy of the information, right? Like scratching down like a, a recipe on a note card or something. It does it, that's called a message or the messenger RNA if you're following this stuff. That gets exported from where the DNA is and goes out and then the rest of the cell uses it to make the protein. So the, 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 the drug uh, HTTIRX, which is a really snappy name, uh, is a drug designed by Ionis after, I mean, 15 years of work um, that, does, uh, that has a target of destroying that message. And so basically what it is is it's about 20 base pairs of DNA. So it's, it's sort of like a little, little chemically modified chunk of DNA. And it goes into cells. It binds its complement, right? It's, there's base pairing in DNA, and it goes in and finds the message, one message, which is the message for the Huntington gene. So it doesn't mess with any of the other 24,000 whatever genes in your cells. It only goes and finds the Huntington gene. And when your cells see this kind of d message bound to a piece of DNA, they, they degrade it for reasons that are probably, I'm talking too much already. And so they get rid of that message. And if you don't have the message, or if you tear up your note card, you're not going to make that recipe. The protein g goes away. So this approach generally is called Huntington lowering, right? We're not silencing it. The DNA is still there. Um, but the phase one study that you're alert, alluding to, and I should, I know you know this, but I should explain this to people, a phase one study, um, so this is, this is nomenclature from the FDA in the U.S., and it's similar in other countries. A phase one study is a safety study, right? So what we're doing is we're taking this little 20 bases of DNA, the chemically modified, and um, to get it into the brain, we have to inject it into the spinal fluid. So it goes in kind of like a spinal tap, if anybody's ever had that, or donated CSF, or had an um, epidural if, um, in childbirth or something. Um, and so... Um, uh, the f if to do that, to do any experimental drug, oh, is this picture of some people? 
just some random people. These are pictures of um, two site heads of this trial, Blair Levitt on the left and uh, some guy over here on the right, uh, delivering the first ever doses of these drugs to people in Vancouver and London, um, which is pretty amazing, and I think we should give them a round of applause. And actually, especially whatever patient let Ed Wilde put his hands all over her back. I think that's really, really brave of her. Um, <laughs> So we've been talking about this for a while. HDBuzz, we're really excited about this trial. Um, you can, there's a whole bunch of stories on HDBuzz about it if you want to catch up on it. So, um, <laughs> what? Oh. <laughs> so a phase one set, okay, so anytime you do an experimental drug that's never been in people, you don't want to give it to 500 or 1,000 people the first time, right? That's, because who knows? I, I mean, we try it, we test it in animals, but you don't know. And especially something that has to go in your spinal fluid, right? You don't want to put it in a thousand people the first time you do it. So there's a very small number of people who take um, what's called a dose escalation study. They start with a tiny dose, then they wait for a little while, then they go up to a little higher dose, and they wait for a little while, watch people go to a little higher dose. And the press release that came out yesterday along the HD Buzz story about it already was that the trial uh, that you're talking about, the safety study, had been fully recruited, meaning everyone is in the study. And that um, this means they've gone up to the highest dose. And reading between the lines, that means they haven't had safety concerns because that's why we do this trial, right? They would have halted it if there were safety concerns. And they've agreed, uh, they being Ionis and Roche, the other uh, pharmaceutical partner in the study, have agreed to do what's called an open label extension, which means that all the people who were in the study, right, even if they started on a low dose, go to the high dose, yep. go to the highest dose that they tested, and they, none of this is US yet. Okay. <laughs> so, so what? So, hang on. I want to pause here because this may not. It may not be obvious to you how big of news this is. The, everyone who was in that study, right, got moved to the highest dose possible, and they're going to continue them on that dose. So, that's probably means that behind the scenes, what they're looking at is encouraging, right? And um, that's really, really exciting news. And it means that while we move into actually bigger trials, including in the U.S testing the drug to see if it works, not just if it's safe, right, which is hundreds of people, not tens of people, um, those people are going to continue to be on the drug, right? We're going to continue to learn from them. We're going to continue from what they're really pioneers. It's really exciting. What are you doing? So, <laughs> okay, so, so the phase one study finishes at the end of this year, like I think in November of this year. We'll read out, meaning we'll get safety data from it at the, either the very end of this year or the very beginning of, the of 2018. And behind the scenes, don't worry, it's not like they're waiting for this to happen, right? They're, they already know that if it's successful, they have to do another big trial, and they're planning that trial. Trust me, it's like happening. So the next study would be not just, is this drug safe, but does this drug make HD better? That's the question. That study will be run. They haven't... Oh. So if you go to the HDSA homepage, as of this morning or late la yesterday evening, the top news item on the front page of the HDSA takes you to this public update for the HD community by Ionis which says, um, it says basically the same as in the press release, but in slightly easier uh, to understand language, to complete enrollment in the safety trial, starting to prepare an open label extension study. Oh, Jeff, could you get rid of that? Um, and then scroll down for me. Thank you. And what is next? Dosing in the final patient group continues. Ionis plans to report the results around the end of this year or early next year, and hopefully that will also include whether, not just safety, but whether the drug lowered the protein. Um, the next step will be to conduct a study to investigate if decreasing mutant Huntington protein can slow the progression of this terrible disease. And then it talks about the next studies, and this is an important piece of information from Ionis. Future studies for the program will be conducted globally and will include US study sites. And I know, I know that people were, people were really frustrated that they couldn't participate in that phase one study. And I want to say a couple of things, and then I'll shut up. I mean, there was, what were the total number of patients? Yeah, there's about 40 or so people in that study, right? You want low numbers. And it was just fastest to get it done in Canada, UK, and Germany. Like, the regulatory agencies went fast. We all want it to happen fast. And it doesn't matter to any of us where those 40 people are, because HD is HD. So if those countries got up and running faster, great, do it there, right? And then, obviously, for the efficacy study, it'd be great if, if there's more availability. Okay, I'll shut up, I promise. Uh, another question, yeah. Um, 
Great question. How many trials do we have to have? But this is generally true of any drug before we can give it to patients. So um, the way this works in theory is that there's what's called a phase one, a phase two, and a phase three study. So a phase one is a safety study we, we mentioned. A phase two is like a smaller scale efficacy study. And then usually a phase three study is a, is a big study with hundreds of patients to prove it really works. Um, the, there's ways to combine those. So if you look into the like nitty gritty details of the Iona study we just talked about, it said, it said one slash two A. So there's kind of ways of compressing those phases and working with the FDA to try and make it happen faster. And I know for sure Ionis and Roche are doing that. In theory, it's possible we could do it with one more trial. Um, we don't know if they'll let us do that yet or if they'll make us go through the normal one, two, three. But watch for the, what the, the, the word you're looking for is what's called a pivotal study. That's like, that's nomenclature. And what that a pivotal study is one where you tell the FDA, this is it, I'm gonna do this study to prove it works or not. So if this trial fails, no dice, and if it succeeds, it gets licensed for people, right? That's, that's what you're looking for. So when you hear announcements about the next trial, which will probably be early next year, you'll hear that. Look for whether it's gonna be a pivotal study or not, and whether it's, uh, and then you'll know if that's, if that's the final one or not. The, In the trial, it's monthly, um, but the drug sticks around for a while, and one of the things that would be really cool to find out that the OLE, the Open Label Extension, may be able to help us figure out is whether you could give the drug less frequently and still get the effect um, that you want. So um, if I were involved in planning that trial, wink, then I would, it's certainly something that I would want to consider uh, folding into the design. You're literally live on the internet right now. You're not hiding secrets. Okay, the gentleman in purple, I'm sorry, sir. You've been waiting for so long. Yes. Uh, you actually, I'll let you guys. No, this. you do the science bit. Okay. You do the science. It's all it's mice. Yeah, we. Um, yeah, so we've 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 heard about this from from people, and anecdotally, there's there's definitely reports that it works. So all I can say as a scientist is we don't have the data. So the way that we know something works is not that it works for one person. Like that, that's great, and it works for that person. That's fine. That's I'm not saying it's true or not true. But what I'm saying is if if we want to make a claim that whatever any intervention makes HD better, we need to do it in big groups of people. We need to have placebo control arms like. That's just how we do science. So if you're asking me as a scientist, I would say that we just currently don't have the data that it, that it works. Um, but there's certainly good reasons for thinking it could. I mean, the, the, the molecules that are in, the, in, in cannabis oil are, are highly, there's, the receptors for them are highly enriched in the part of the brain that dies in Huntington's. There's, there's tons of reasons for, for thinking it's a reasonable approach, but we just haven't done the study yet. So I guess that's all I can say. The other thing is that this, sorry, the circuitry, the electronic and chemical circuitry in that part of the brain is super complicated. Um, so if you look at Parkinson's disease, uh, people with early Parkinson's disease have a lot of tremor. So you give them a drug that replaces the missing chemical in the brain, and for a while it works, but then later that drug starts to cause problems and they start to get involuntary movements very similar to the career that we see in Huntington's disease. So there's no, there's no quick, uh, easy solutions here, especially when the brain is changing year on year. So I think the answer with CBD and cannabis oil products generally is gonna be that some people may find some of them helpful at some stage of the illness, but at another stage or with some other product or with some other people, some of the uh, uh, effects of those drugs might make them worse. For instance, apathy. I mean, you know, we, we all know what the sort of stereotype of stoners is. Some people might find that the, and apathy is a big problem in Huntington's disease. So some patients may find that these, this family of drugs makes that apathy worse, and that might, m might make more of a difference than any benefit they get from movements. I think it's until we have proper trials, we, all we can say is, by all means, try them, but do it safely and, um, uh, try not to generalize from individual experiences to, to, ev to everyone else. Make sense? Cool. So the, so the question is about the connections between Alzheimer's and Huntington's disease, because in both cases, when you look at the brains, you have these like plaques, you know, the, the kind of gumps of protein that build up and would clumps. Did I say dumps? I don't know. 
<laughs> had very little sleep. Um, so the question is, if, if, we, if we find a way to get rid of them in one disease, would it help another? Um, I, think, I think it's definitely possible. There have been some um, really uh, good drugs in Alzheimer's disease, good in the sense that they do their job, which is to clear out those plaques. Um, and they do that very effectively. This is an Alzheimer's, not Huntington's disease. The surprising thing about those trials is they got rid of the plaques, but they didn't make people any better. And in fact, in some cases, might have slightly made people worse. So, no, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, th I don't think we know anything about, about connections between, uh, well, hang on, let me, the other thing I wanted to say, and I'm going to let Ed, Ed an answer that question, but um, the other thing I was going to say about fixing, it, like if we could learn from Alzheimer's for Huntington's, I think we're farther in Huntington's. I think Alzheimer's wants to learn from us. I think, listen, what's happening in Alzheimer's right now is they've, they've run hundreds of millions of dollars worth of trials with these drugs to reduce plaques in the brain with the effect that I just mentioned. And they realized, hey, maybe instead of waiting for people to be like demented and treat their brains and get rid of the plaques, maybe we should try to treat them early which in Alzheimer's is really hard because most Alzheimer's patients don't have a mutation that causes them to get it. So they have to, they're actually running trials like in the mountains of Columbia in rare families that have mutations that do cause Alzheimer's disease to basically do what we can do in Huntington's already, which is test people early and give them drugs before they get sick. So I, I think we're gonna drive it, not the other way around. I agree, and the evidence for that is that this gene silencing trial that we're running using the Ionis ASO drug, the, the drug that's injected into the spinal fluid, we, once we were 18 months into that trial, um, the, the, the hospital where I work became interested in and, became, and signed on to do a trial of a similar drug in Alzheimer's disease. And they're using our experience of injecting that drug into HD to plan the, ne the, the first trial of a drug like that in Alzheimer's disease. On, the her on, on whether Alzheimer's is inherited or not, it hardly ever is. Less than 1% of cases of Alzheimer's run in uh, families like Huntington's disease does. So um, there are the, it's, it's slightly more likely in within a family, but the risk, the lifetime risk of Alzheimer's is something like 5%. If you're from a family that has several, if you have several first degree relatives with Alzheimer's, that risk may go up to eight or 9%, something like that. These figures are off the top of my head, but that's the general idea. But the chance that you won't get Alzheimer's, even with several next generate next uh, first degree relatives with, uh, with Alzheimer's, it is still 90, 91, 92%. So, the, uh, and everyone's at risk of Alzheimer's, essentially. So th there's no evidence that, that having re a single relative with Alzheimer's uh, will um, worsen your own course of Huntington's disease, uh, should you be positive, or, or anything for any of uh, other members of your family. There's a gentleman in red who's had his hand up for ages. <laughs> yeah. So the question was, was your wife had fibro just for the mic your wife had fibromyalgia that used to affect her it significantly and until she developed Huntington's disease and then it it stopped being a problem. Well, um fibro I mean I'll try and answer it as general a way as possible. Fibromyalgia we don't really know what causes fibromyalgia but it's a complicated disease that involves the brain and the body. Um and it's possible that some biological or psychological effect of Huntington's in the brain changed the way that her brain interpreted the signals that were causing the fibromyalgia, I guess. Uh, essentially, I think what's, what it sounds like is that it, the, the physical and uh, neurological effects of the Huntington's disease probably overtook the fibromyalgia um, in some way. Uh, and what's interesting is that there's this, there's a whole family of, of conditions called functional neurological disorders where people get uh, symptoms in the body that you would think would have a, some sort of physical cause in the brain, but we can't find a physical cause. And those, so those conditions are very common. One person in five coming into a neurology clinic will have one of those conditions. And they're manageable, but not with drugs. Interestingly, I think in Huntington's, it's not been studied, but I think the incidence of those conditions in Huntington's disease is much lower. So this, this might be another family of conditions, possibly because c some of this kind of brain-body feedback loops that cause or make them worse, and fibromyalgia certainly falls into that category where the brain and the body are in some way not connecting properly. 
um, and the person experiences fatigue and disability, those uh, may be kind of, the, the cycle may be broken when the symptoms of Huntington's disease begin. It's a very interesting observation. Can't explain it. I gave a long answer though. Jeff, give the man a hat. Yeah, it's a great question. What about pe hope for people who are in the later stages of the condition? So my um, philosophy, based on what I know about the science uh, and clinical features of Huntington's, is that throughout the disease, you have a certain number of brain cells that are completely healthy, and you have a certain number that are alive but unhappy and are malfunctioning, and you have a certain number which have died. And I'm sorry to say, everyone in this room, unless you're under the age of 25, you will have fewer brain cells at the end of this session than you had at the beginning. <laughs> so don't applaud that. <laughs> That's terrible news. <laughs> So, um, and Huntington's is essentially, uh, it accelerates the death, the, uh, the death of brain cells in a way that produces symptoms. Now, at the moment, we can't do anything to re replace those brain cells that have died. But all the other kinds, the kind that are healthy and the kind that are unhealthy but alive, those are the things that theoretically can be helped. We can protect the healthy ones and we can help the unhealthy ones to make themselves better. And removing the cause of Huntington's disease, the mutant protein, should help all of those things to happen. And we've seen improvement in mice after they get symptoms. And we're starting the first trials in early Huntington's disease, because really th those are the patients in whom we can judge improvement and deterioration most quickly and most efficiently. But Everybody wants these drugs and anything that works to go into anyone who could be helped, even theoretically. So um, the next trial, the pivotal trial that Jeff was talking about, will almost certainly involve patients later in the disease than the current safety trial. I don't know how much later, but this current safety trial had an had a inclusion criteria where your functional score had to be between 11 and 13, which basically means that most people were within a year or two of the symptoms beginning, so it was super early Huntington's disease. The next trial um, will need lots more patients, and it would make sense to include a, a broader range of patients. A big priority is going earlier, so adding on some kind of component where we can start to test whether these drugs can prevent Huntington's disease, but everybody also wants to give the drug later on in the disease and, and see what happens and see what, how, how much we can bring people back if we can meaningfully uh, achieve this goal of, of removing the cause of HD. Um, we are... Um, I, I don't. I can't remember whose slogan it is, but someone has a slogan. Well, some branch of the armed forces has a slogan: "No, no one left behind." Right, and that, I think that's our. Um, we promise to do everything we can to stick to that s slogan. I love it when you talk military. <laughs> 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 uh, I wanted to say one thing about that too. I wanted to like interject a little science. So like. The, th the thing about brain cells is once they die, they're really hard to put back. But one thing that I think is underappreciated, so when you hear about these, these, uh, these brain imaging findings from like the track HD and the, and the predict HD study, that oh, brains are shrinking many years before people even have symptoms, one, one thing people don't appreciate is if you actually, it, it, we don't have very many samples, but people who've died like just before onset or right at onset, the number of cells, the number of brain cells that are there hasn't changed. So it's shrinking a little bit, but the cells aren't dead yet. So even when somebody gets sick, probably most of their cells are still there, meaning that if we can, if we can stop the insult, they could, they could actually recover, right? It's when the cells are actually gone, then it's kind of hard to fix them. But um, I think there's, the news is more optimistic than people think. Yeah, they're unhealthy, but they're fixable. The other thing is, y anyone who's a carer or has been a carer for someone with relatively late stage HD, you know that they have good days and bad days, right? If they're hungry or if they're uncomfortable, you can tell that they're having a terrible day and they, their behavior is worse, they shout, they writhe around and everything is much worse. And then sometimes you won't know why they're having a good day, but they are. So even if we can help people with advanced HD to have more good days and fewer bad days, and I think that that's because we know that they're having those kinds of days already and they can go from a bad day on Monday to a good day on Tuesday. So that's recovery, right? If, and if we can get a drug that helps more good days, then on average that's still definitely a good thing. Question from the floor. Wait, are you Misty? Oh, hey, Ed. He, he literally said that last convention. He said, oh, are you Misty? They're Twitter buddies, by the way. <laughs> I'm completely clueless, but hi.
Good questions. We should say a word about the WAVE trial because uh, you wait a lifetime for a gene silencing trial in HD and then two come along shortly after the first one came along. Uh, you do the talking and I'll do the slides. This will be fun because I have no idea what's on the slides. Um, <laughs> so the, the IONIS trial that we've been mentioning, uh, so everybody, okay, so you get one HD gene from mom, one from dad, right? And if you have HD, one of them was mutated, usually almost only one. Um, oh, that's exactly what's on the slide. Uh, <laughs> Right, so normally, so in this case, mom has HD, you get the mutant copy of the gene from mom, right? You have, all the kids have a 50% chance because you either get her sort of good chromosome or her bad. You're not supposed to say good and bad, or any, it's like you're not supposed to say mutant, mutant or mutation anymore, but that's fine. Um, we're all friends. Um, so, so most of us, like me, who have the HD mutation have one normal HD gene and one mutant HD gene, right? That's the case for greater than 99% of HD patients. So. The IONIS trial that we're talking about, the Huntington lowering study, is not discriminating between these two. It's lowering both of them. Not completely, as we talked about. It's not gene silencing. It's Huntington lowering. And there are ways that I uh, did a big chunk of my PhD studying, so I could talk to you like indefinitely, but I'll spare you. Um, there are ways of discriminating between those, the, the good copy and the bad copy of the HD gene, and using the same kind of technology, right, ASOs, those little bits of DNA, to only go in and target the mutant copy. And so Wave Life Sciences, which is a company in Cambridge, uh, US, not Cambridge, UK, uh, has um, plans uh, to start um, trial, is 2017 still? For, they're hoping, they're hoping in 20, I'm looking at what people from Wave, they're hoping in 2017 to launch not one, but two ASO trials with, with ASOs that target only the mutant copy of the HD gene, not the regular copy, which is obviously better if, if, if it's possible in theory. Um, now the trick is, and the reason that they need more than one is that you need to have not, uh, you have to have the HD mutation obviously, right, the CAG expansion and the Huntington gene that gives you HD or else you wouldn't be in the study. You also have to have other uh, genetic variants. The ASOs they're targeting, they work by targeting little tiny variants in the DNA, not the CAG, elsewhere in the gene. And so you have to not only have the HD mutation, you have to have one of these variants that they're using to target that specific gene. It's a little complicated, I'm gonna shut up because people are staring at me now. But the bottom line is that not all people who are, are going to be eligible for each of those ASOs, which is why they have more than one. So they're gonna have two trials, one, uh, uh, one of which they hope gets almost 50% of people who have the mutation will also have this other uh, variant that they can use for target. And if they're not eligible for that one, you may be eligible for, for a second one. And so inclusion criteria, um, the inclusion criteria for the next IONIS trial have not yet been released, but I would be surprised if it does not include a broader range of people, as I've said. Um, there, it's unlikely there'll be an upper CAG limit. The age limits for the trials have been pretty generous, so it was 25 to 65 in the current trial. Um, the reason it's 25 is because the brain is still developing until the age of 25, and that is the situation in which we don't want to switch off the wild type, the normal Huntington. Um, the, um, it's unlikely that patients with juvenile HD would be eligible because most of them would either be too young or by the time they're old enough, they'd be too far advanced in the disease. But again, no one, no one left behind. The JHD people are among the people we're most keen to treat if we can prove that this drug is, that any of these drugs are, are working. For the WAVE trial, and Wendy will, um, Wendy from WAVE, give us a WAVE. Um, she's, um, there's a WAVE uh, desk outside, so you can go and chat to the WAVE team, and, and Paul from WAVE is going to be giving an update during the research forum tomorrow. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember what the inclusion criteria are, but they're roughly the same um, as, the, uh, as the IONIS trial. Is there a lower age limit? 25, so similar. Um, but these are, you know, this is for the trials, and I guess if you're young, and don't have symptoms, you wouldn't be able to take part in any of these trials anyway, because you have to be symptomatic at the moment until we start adding pre-symptomatic uh, um, extras to, to the trials. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Uh, and I'll, I want to just add something, because I don't, I'm very sensitive about leaving behind juvenile HD people. So, so people ask me, like, okay, you're, you're literally, I'm in the same situation many of you are in, I have the mutation, would I, want, would I take this drug is the question I often get. Being older than 25 with the Ionis drug, for example, that doesn't discriminate between the mutant copy and the regular copy of Huntington, um, if I were under 25 personally, 
uh, I would not take the drug. Um, because brain development, we, what the Huntington gene does is actually pretty obscure. Believe it or not, we've been studying it since 1993, and we don't have a great idea about it. But one of the things that's very clear is it has really important roles in brain development. And like in mice, where we can get rid of it when they're still developing, you can totally screw up their brains by turning off the Huntington gene really early. So it's not that we don't want to treat juvenile HD people. There's a, there's a real potential risk during development. One other thing to say, which is terribly amusing to me in my head, and let's see how it goes, uh, is that there's this phrase, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Um, or there's a Scottish poem about mice and men, which is much the same. So these are the, this is how we, we, the academic community, and the uh, pharmaceutical industry community intend to work together to plan these future trials. If in mid the middle of 2018, it is reported that a gene silencing drug has successfully lowered the level of mutant Huntington in the spinal fluid, then there's nothing to stop 5,000 people from HD families banging on the front door of the FDA and saying, we demand to be able to give this drug to our family members with juvenile Huntington's disease, and then start a discussion about how that might happen. There are other ways of getting drugs than the no, let me, let me reissue that. <laughs> there are many ways to consider the right ways of getting drugs into the people that need them. And a hugely important part of that process is the voice of the patient community. The FDA, if you don't, if you don't answer the FDA's surveys or tell the FDA or take part in the discussion, they'll make a decision. And that's fine. And the decisions are usually very good, I have to say. Um, if you feel very strongly that there's a particular group that's going to have to wait too long to get the drug, take part in the discussion, and they will listen to your views and take them on board. That's okay, right? You feel like that's reasonable? What was the first part of the question? A lovely dog made a noise, so I didn't hear it. Oh, the legato study. It's still, uh, no, it's, I don't know about any individual site, but the legato study is still going on. So le, le, it's still going on in the world. We're still running it at um, uh, UCL. What happened was, so legato is a study sponsored by Teva Pharmaceuticals of a drug called Laquinimod, which we hope will gently reduce the activity of the brain's immune system in a way that may help to prevent the immune system from causing kind of friendly fire damage to our neurons. And that study's been running for a couple of years now. There was a, there was a, a, a bijou hiccup et at the beginning of um, <laughs> 2016, I believe. A small hiccup. A small hiccup at the beginning of 2016, where from another study in a different disease, multiple sclerosis of the same drug, um, they noticed that there were more cardiac events happening in the group that was taking the drug. Now, it's a different disease. They were taking slightly different doses, and uh, that was a different gr group of patients, so the ages and risk factors were different. So essentially, what happened is they had to stop the top two doses, or was it perhaps the top dose? I can't quite remember the details. Anyway, there was some dose of uh, laquinimod in the Huntington's disease legato study that had to be stopped, but the rest of the trial carried on. Um, so that study, it, it, uh, it, I don't, I can't, answer a question about why any one particular study site may have discontinued, but the rest of the study definitely is still happening, and uh, the reason I know that is because we're still doing it. The second part of your question was, you've had an idea, and how do you, how do you bring it to prime time? Um, there's a story, it's from accounting, about two accountants who are, um, two economists who are walking down the street, and one of them says, oh look, there's $10 on the sidewalk. And the other one says, don't be ridiculous. If there was $10 on the sidewalk, someone would have picked it up already. So um, there's uh, some scientists are closed-minded and others are not. But uh, if you have a good idea, speak to a scientist. Email people, come and talk to us, and we'll tell you what we think. Please don't email me pictures of, of urine, which someone just did. <laughs> I opened my inbox the other day and there was, someone had sent me photographs of their urine at different stages of the day and I was like, I didn't sign up for this. Like, <laughs> this is why I work on mice. Uh, yes, in black. Oh, um, 
Yeah, I think it's difficult to do research anywhere. Um, I mean, in, in, in light of, you know, government funding and constraints, and I'm going to get on a rant about the National Institute of Health, which just denied my, I think, very brilliant grant. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure Ed will say similar things about the, I mean, look, let's just, I want to, I want to leave people with the right message, which is optimism. In HD, the amount of resources being pushed, not just at the clinical side that we keep talking about, all these clinical trials, but the basic research that's happening is, is leaps and bounds above what any other disease that I know of is undergoing right now. The, the amount of resources in particular from the CHGI Foundation that's driving a lot of this are incredible. And yes, it's frustrating and grants get denied, but I think both in, the, in Europe and in the US, so much is happening that in HD that it's hard to be, be picky. The, I think the, the main difference from my perspective as a clinical slash translational researcher is that um, countries that don't have a national health system, uh, I think it's harder to run trials in those countries. The, um, it's harder to, uh, the, I, I don't know, it's, I don't know qu something about the psychology or history or something, but in Europe and other countries that have uh, free healthcare embedded into their way of life, Part of that has always been your health care is free you, because you paid for it, but it's free at the point of delivery and you'll never be given a bill, but you have to help us train doctors and medical students and you have to, you don't have to do any of this, but it's kind of expected the quid pro quo is that research is part of it and that's not exploitative because the research is there to help the patients, but there's much more, the, 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 the national health care system in the, the NHS in the UK has always been intrinsically linked with cutting edge research um, because the two of those amplify each other. And I think it's just much more difficult to incorporate big research programs into healthcare systems that are run by lots of different corporations. Uh, yeah. Other science questions? <laughs> Lady with the turquoise underneath beige. treatments for symptoms, symptoms. Yeah. um yeah do you, i mean uh ed do you want to talk about any specific ones i mean i guess <laughs> yeah so do tetrabenazine was just approved to help with korea basically a, a, a new and improved version of tetrabenazine to help people um comply with taking it um there's a there's a Oh, the differences between do tetrabenazine, the, the recently approved drug, um, and tetrabenazine. It's super weird, actually. Uh, it's like literally kind of atomic physics. But basically, the, they've substituted some of the atoms in tetrabenazine with a, with, with a modified heavy form that is metabolized by the body slower. So it, it's sort of, it's like the same drug, but different. It's like, it works the same, but it sticks around the body longer. So ultimately, I mean, one of the problems with tetrabenazine, I think people are taking it three times a day, you get these really big spikes in dose, so it's really hard to regulate the, the amount in the bloodstream. Um, and so do tetrabenazine smooths this out and you can take it less because it sticks around longer. So that's an improvement, or improved uh, symptomatic treatment. Um, I mean, most of the drugs that we use for treating symptoms of HD are drugs that have been around for years and they're used, they, they, they come from other conditions. So we use a lot of, um, uh, drugs that are used in schizophrenia, for instance, those can help with the, some of the behavioral ups and downs in Huntington's as well as the movements. We use a lot of antidepressants. Um, uh, we use some benzodiazepines for anxiety, uh, melatonin for sleep. So um, I don't know about new drugs for symptoms. If the, it, apart from deutetrabenazine, I think if, if history teaches us anything, it's that other conditions will develop drugs for their own thing, like maybe Park, a new Parkinson's disease will come out, and then people will start using that in Huntington's and find that it helps. Uh, the focus in the HD research community is very much on um, developing new drugs to slow down the progression of HD, I have to say, because really that is, uh, I guess, because we have the gene and we have reasonable symptom control drugs from other conditions. The assumption is our, our attention and our money is best spent developing new drugs to prevent and slow the progression. There's a Oh, so the question, how long, if you're on tetrabenazine, how long do you have to go off it before you can be in a trial? That it, it, it does depend entirely on the drug. Some drug trials, 
you can't be taking tetrabenazine at all, and I think you have to be on it for you have to have a, like a one month or two month washout period before you can go on it on the trial drug. Others, it's completely fine, and they don't mind you being on tetrabenazine. The usual thing is that your drugs have to be your drug regime, whatever it is, has to be stable for two or three months before you can enroll in the trial. Um, and of course, Teva is running a program of testing due tetrabenazine. I don't think there's any still recruiting, but in, you know, for instance, they're running a crossover study where they take people on tetrabenazine and then the next day they put them on an equivalent dose of due tetrabenazine. It's called Ostido. There's a stand outside. And um, so it, it varies a lot. The best way to find out about specifics about any trial like that is to go to hdtrialfinder.org, I'm going to say. Um, and that's the Huntington's Disease Society of America's customized trial finding program where you can and you click through you give, give some basic information it gives you a list of studies you may be eligible for and then you can click through to the individual inclusion and exclusion criteria and there's a phone number where you can speak directly to the trial coordinator local to you okay is that the azavan trial or is that something else Oh, yeah, okay, so SRX 246 is a trial being run by the NIH, and you don't have to change your medication regime. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, sorry? Give out hands. What protein? Chaperone, did you say? Heat shock proteins. Oh, okay, interesting. Question about heat shock proteins and whether they can prevent neurodegeneration through... protein misfolding and cell death. <laughs> <laughs> I could um, try. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely really good animal evidence. So there, there are these things called heat shock proteins, which were discovered because in yeast, um, they were discovered that if you, if you heat up yeast re really hot and shock them with heat, their proteins get screwed up, and then they have this, like, cellular defense mechanism to kind of, like, refold all their proteins and fix all their cellular machines. And there's a bunch of these now. Um, and when you put them in mice that have the HD gene, they, they get better. Um, so it's definitely, like, an avenue that's, that's, that's scientifically really interesting. The question is whether we would have a drug that would, that would mimic that. Currently, currently, we don't. There's lots of drugs that have that side effect, yeah. Which use it? Oh, sauna? Well, they're not released. They're inside of cells. So, but you would have to change the temperature of your brain cells. So a sauna might work for your skin, but if the inside of your brain gets hotter than 37, you pretty rapidly die. I'm not a neurologist, but... <laughs> Um, so it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a totally reasonable approach, but the, the trick for brain cells is finding a way to do that with a chemical rather than with heat, because you can't get the inside of your brain that hot or that cold. It regulates temperature really high, or really finely. The, you, yeah, okay, so... Um, <laughs> it's a good thing we were so prepared. Uh, <laughs> So this is another of these Huntington lowering strategies, right? So we, we've talked about the Iona study, the upcoming WAVE study. Oh, fun. Um, there's, there's another thing. They're called zinc fingers because the actual, the actual molecules have a zinc atom in them. And they're, they're fingers because they're, they're proteins that are kind of shaped like little fingers. And they're, they're, they're designed by like artificial evolution to go in and stick to specific regions of the DNA, right? So upstream, if you like, from everything else we've been talking about, the ASO is actually at the level of the DNA. These little fingers go in there and find a specific sequence that people in the lab can tweak. And there's a company called Sangamo uh, Biosciences that's working uh, with a company called Shire, a big pharma company, to develop these for HD. The idea being you make fingers that go along and find the HD gene, in fact, just the mutant copy, and block that gene from ever getting used, transcribed, we'd say. And those, I don't know the status of the trial. It's, 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 they're planning a study. We haven't heard. So uh, it's been a while since there's been an update, but this, that's the way it tends to be with uh, drug companies. Uh, the latest we heard was that they are still planning a human trial. Say again? Oh, presenting oh they're presenting tomorrow. There you go. Um, a lot has changed in the... So th th these zinc... A couple of things about zinc fingers. Firstly, they at the moment, no trial is proposed of a zinc finger or any other drug that edits the DNA. So the difference here is that they act on the DNA, but they are shushing it rather than editing it. 
So instead of shushing the message, we shush the DNA. Um, the upside to that is that the way that these drugs would be delivered is that they would be packaged. He had a hat already. It's that they would be packaged into a, into a, a harmless virus, and the virus would then be injected into the brain. The virus infects the brain cells and turns the brain cells into a factory for making the drug molecule. So your brain cells contain the DNA that makes the harmful protein, and alongside it, they also make a protein which switches off the harmful protein. So it's kind of a bit complicated, but the upside is a, the theoretically a single shot injection into the brain, although that would be a slightly unusual day, um, is uh, going to be very long lasting theoretically you could it could last your whole lifetime and part of this is the merry go round of viruses and where you get on the carousel so um people are constantly working to make the viruses that might be used for these treatments better and safer and one notable experiment last year the green, this is a mouse brain, and they injected a virus uh, into the blood to see what would get into the brain. And essentially hardly any of it w turned bright green, indicating that the virus had got into the brain. And then they mutated the virus and chose the ones that were best at getting into the brain. And what they found was that with the mutated virus, a lot more of the brain received doses of the virus. Now this is, th because this is a brand new virus, you ha have to go back to square one and test it for safety and test it in humans to see whether you see the same thing and maybe you won't and you'll have to find other ways of making viruses better but if you're a company that's developing these virally delivered stuff do you start a trial now with viruses that are that don't spread in the brain very much or do you wait maybe three years or five years until the better viruses come along and then go in with those these are difficult decisions because no one knows what's going to happen in the future Um, wow, those are easy questions. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Those were not easy questions, Internet. Uh, the well, let me do the first one because it's a little like uh, less loaded. The first question that I'm about to repeat, thank you, Ed, uh, was what do I do um, uh, as a mutation carrier who follows this stuff for his day job? Um, I don't really do anything special. I mean, I, I wish that I could tell you, oh, there's this secret vitamin combination that, that nobody knows. There is no secret. Right? If, if there was a secret cure for HD, I would have told you about it the second I found out about it. It's just not there. Um, and so besides the things that Ed mentioned, which you can do, which and r are really meaningful, like taking care of yourself, exercising, eating well, sleeping well, which is really important, not stressing out by going on flights all over the world like I've been all week. Like, take care of yourself is all you can do. And, but besides that, there's no secret. And I don't do anything. If, if, when I start doing something, you all will know about it, right? Like, it, it, there's, there's nothing behind the scenes right now, unfortunately. Um, so I guess that's good news, bad news. And the other question um, was, if, w why not with HD, why don't we, if someone gets really late stage, why don't we just let them take any experimental medicine? Uh, well, for one, I don't think any drug company would do it. I mean, it's all downside for them, right? You take somebody who's really sick, they're dying anyway, you give them a mega dose of your drug and they die, and then your drug is tainted by, the, you know, like, it's very tricky to imagine a scenario in which it would be I mean, ethical, but also even just to the company's benefit. I'm not, you know, I don't think that we could convince him it was a good idea. Also, uh, and I'll let Ed chime in, <laughs> like physically holding him away from the microphone. Um, what was I gonna say? <laughs> you just, <laughs> I mean, another thing to think about, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm, this is just like all mind games at this point, because it's all theoretical, but like, when somebody's very late stage, you might wanna really consider whether if we had an intervention that would stop the progression of HD, would you want it? Personally speaking, and watching my mom die, at the late stage, I wouldn't have wanted to. I was, you know, it was, it was sad when my mom died, but it was a relief. And I'm sure people know what I'm talking about. Like, it was the saddest, best thing that happened to me when my mom actually died. 
So th we want to be really careful about throwing things at the very late stage that might have a risk of like stabilizing people in that state for even longer. But I'll let. The, there's a, there is this concept of compassionate use for drugs that have been shown to be somewhat effective in so, some groups of patients. So, um, uh, you know, you can develop a drug and you can get a signal that it's effective in some patients on some level. So for Huntington's disease, that might be it's been tested in early HD and it uh, slows the progression or it lowers the Huntington protein. And we believe that is helpful. And a big trial is now happening to see whether that slows the progression. There is uh, there's a theoretic the rules around compassionate use are not clear. Um, and again, it depends to some extent on things like lobbying by families and by d disease communities. But in, under a compassionate use scenario, the drug company can supply the drug to groups of patients likely to benefit from it who are not likely to be eligible for taking the drug either in a trial or through the drug being formally licensed. As soon as the drug is licensed, the compassionate use generally stops, and those people then have to switch on to the regular way of getting it. And certainly patients, I don't know, I'm, I can't predict the future, and I don't think, I don't, I'm not aware of any discussions where compassionate use has been raised um, in any sort of s substantive way. But the patients with juvenile HD may be among those who, uh, for whom uh, compassionate use would be considered in a kind of open label setting. So you, you give the drug to everyone and see what happens, right? And if it works, you keep, if it seems to be working, you keep taking it and you fold that evidence into the larger portfolio of our understanding. On community advocacy and just giving drugs that seem really good, the HIV community, there's this really good film called How to Survive a Plague. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's about the, um, uh, the gay community in New York um, and a group of people who, I, think, I can't remember what their, their name was, but anyway, they ACT UP, act up thank you. They, there was this drug called AZT, which was the first anti-HIV drug to be on the market, and it was all being tested in clinical trials. Apparently, the, get the, the um, people in the uh, the early trials of those used to sit in the waiting room swapping pills with each other because they figured that uh, on average getting half a dose was better than a chance of getting the placebo. So those trials became more difficult because of people trying to kind of short circuit things. And then they they did what I talked about earlier. They stormed, literally stormed the FDA. They were sitting on the roof of the FDA and they were storming the meetings. And as a result of that very intensive lobbying, the FDA relaxed its rules on which of those drugs could get licensed. AZT got licensed much sooner and was very widely prescribed. And it turned out not to be particularly good. And it started kind of harming people's livers in a way that actually made their lives worse. So you have to, and then the better drugs came along. And it's not clear what the right thing to do in that situation was in retrospect but it's certainly a lesson in terms of how the conversation between patients and drug regulators and companies needs to go. Do you come and come to the front and say, speak into the mic because we're not going to be able to repeat all this. And it's Invited guest speaker. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so again, Dan Leonard from Unicure. We're one of the companies developing a gene therapy. And when you, um, in, the, in the early phase of development, the, the manufacturing scale is so small. I mean, it literally can happen in a room smaller than this. Um, and scaling up is incredibly difficult. So normally there isn't a tremendous amount available. Um, and you might manufacture just enough to be able to supply your cl clinical trial. Um, and so that becomes a big challenge as well, just the manufacturing scale. And, and scaling up can be uh, fraught with peril. <laughs> it doesn't always go well. Thanks, Sam. I want to I say one more thing as, with my patient advocate hat on, because this just happened in the U.S. Um, in the Duchenne muscular dystrophy field. I don't know if you guys have heard, but there was a drug approved for a subset of kids who have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, what's the name of this drug? It's some stupid commercial name, Exxon. A Tepler's in, but yeah. yeah. So there's this drug that <laughs> <laughs> these kids are dying, right? They have neuromuscular disease. They're losing muscle control and they're dying. And they were in an experimental trial of this drug, and they basically stormed the FDA, as Ed said. And they got against the uh, recommendations of the FDA scientific panel. They got the drug approved based on just like some changes in protein level, not actually like making the kids better. And 
they kind of forced the FDA's hand and got this drug approved, and that sounds great, right? Like, get the drug approved earlier. But now the drug is being refused to be paid for by insurance companies because they're saying, look, we don't actually have evidence this works. So it's not that we want to get drugs approved for HD. We want to get drugs to HD patients. And that means we, want, we need to force the FDA to listen to us, but we have to run good trials because there's no point in getting a drug approved that we can't get. So we have to, we have to be honest, but we have to push the FDA. So. Do we still need human brains for study? Yes, absolutely. And, So how do, you, how do you arrange tissue donation? Tissue donations are incredibly important, and, and until this whole like finding a cure thing is sorted, we need, yeah, if the question is, do we need tissues or blood or samples or DNA, the answer is yes. If you're willing, you should donate them, and that's wonderful. And probably you should speak with your local clinic, your HD clinic. Um, sorry? Oh, yes, that's right. And we also need, we need control subjects, too. So family members, think about donating. It's it. Yeah. There are the, the the history of brain collection in HD has been that that for a long time we didn't have enough brains, and then um, a few local collections sprung up. So New Zealand have been big, and Harvard have been big at collecting brains and various other places. But getting Looking back, a big problem has been that the consistency with which the brains has been handled has not been good. And any kind of delay, even of a few hours, getting a brain from the person who's no longer using it to the place where it needs to be and preserved and pickled and sectioned and all of those things. Pickled is not the right word, but it was the only one I could think of. Um, <laughs> those things have to be super consistent because otherwise there's no point. Um, and this is why... Um, if you are not very close to one of these sentences that's doing it in an incredibly rigorous way, um, it, it, may not be, it may not be worth doing. But the thing to do is to, is to reach out to your local center of excellence and say, what, did, what do we have that's local to me? M another question. So how many sites of the U.S. are going to be in the next IONIS study and what are those sites going to be? It has not been. If it's been determined, I don't know, and it certainly hasn't been announced. I was surprised yesterday that they put out the statement saying that the, the next study will involve the U.S. That was a significant revelation, um, but I think you'll have to make do with that for the time being and uh, keep, keep chewing it until the next mouthful comes along. Gentleman in green. It's you. <laughs> Yeah, so the Vaxinex drug is an interesting one. It's the first antibody that's been tested in Huntington's disease. So um, antibody drugs are used a lot in other conditions, especially those conditions that involve the immune system. So things like rheumatoid arthritis uh, or lupus, you can treat those with antibodies. And the antibody basically changes the behavior of the immune system. Cancer has a lot of antibody drugs licensed for it. So that there's an antibody that's completely revolutionized the treatment of m malignant melanoma. Um, and that's, uh, so these are, these are powerful drugs, targeted drugs, and they essentially hijack the immune system to, um, to alter the biology of the body. Um, the Vaxinex drug uh, is an antibody directed at a, a receptor, like a sensor molecule on the brain called semaphorin 4D. Four. Three? Four. Four. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, Amber did the study. <laughs> and um, it's, it's not quite clear what the link is between that molecule and Huntington's disease, but Amber Southwell, sitting in the front row working in UBC at the time, did some um, experiments in mice that demonstrated that there was a connection between the presence of the HD gene and some kind of malfunctioning of the semaphore and 4D system. And I can't remember how the drug works exactly. I think it is a competitive agonist, right, of that receptor, something like that. I think it activates the receptor and in the process it blocks it, but if anyone for Vaxinex is here, please do correct me. Anyway, 
They are running the first ever trial of that drug. Uh, the drug is injected into the blood, so it doesn't have to be injected into the nervous system. Um, and the, I know the trial is fully recruited, and there was the, they released some data showing that there was some changes on the MRI scans and some changes on a scan that looks at the metabolism of the brain. Um, on first glance, those changes look good. Like the, they showed that the shrinkage of the brain had been seem to have been slowed, but the caveat is that these are very small sample numbers, um, so that might have occurred by chance. The other thing is that in the early days of the Alzheimer's trials that involved antibodies, um, something similar was seen in terms of metabolism and brain shrinkage, but it later turned out that actually the drug was making the brain cells swell, um, which was giving a kind of false impression that the dr disease was slowing. I think what we can say about the Vaxnex trial is it's it's, they've re reached a significant milestone in that trial. They've released data which, which look genuinely very interesting. And the next thing to do is to complete the trial and, and see what the data show once they're published in detail. Oh, cool. Okay. Can anyone who's been on a clinical trial raise their hand? And can the rest of the room clap? And now, anyone who's been in any kind of research study for HD, please raise your hand. And hopefully there won't be anyone left to clap, but if there are, please clap. <laughs> and various people, various people are waving at us to tell us that we have to stop. Go on Twitter and look for the hashtag HD Research Heroes, and uh, let's spread some love for the people who help with research. Thank you very much for all your attention. We'll be back tomorrow.